Hello and welcome to the Wellness Mama podcast. I'm Katie from wellnessmama.com and this episode is all about berberine, which I have been experimenting with recently and I'm currently really fascinated with. And I'm here with two people who have a lot of knowledge in this area, David Roberts, who holds an MPH from John Hopkins, a master's in BME from UVA and a bachelor's and a BME from Duke. But he more importantly has more than 25 years of public health experience on three continents and he's one of the co-founders of the Gut Supplement Restore, which is now called ION. I'm also here with John Gildea, who is a Johns Hopkins trained PhD with 65 scientific publications from over 20 NIH funded studies. He is an expert in cell culture and exosomes, performing all the science behind the supplement called Restore, which is now called ION. And John was instrumental in the stabilization of sulforaphane and broccoli, which I've talked about on here before, because this was a compound that was previously not able to be stabilized into supplemental form. But in this episode, We talk all about berberine and its implications when it comes to sleep, glucose, insulin, and aging. They explain what berberine is and the berberine-glucose connection, as well as how it affects ketosis and how to use it therapeutically. They talk about the melatonin connection and how melatonin also affects the glucose cycle. We talk about the timing of berberine for better sleep and appropriate cortisol response, including a study that showed that berberine was more effective than Valium at sleep, and it also may increase deep sleep, which is that restorative cycle of sleep that's so beneficial for the brain and also flushing of things like the liver. We talk about the many types of berberine and why some don't pass through the gut barrier effectively and how to know if one is. We talk about the CMYC gene connection to berberine and how berberine blocks gluconeogenesis, and how it increases butyrate, which is beneficial for the brain as well as other things, and how berberine can be fasting mimicking for this reason. We also talk about myostatin and how it inhibits muscle growth and how to use things like berberine to help muscle growth while staying lean. And then we talk about berberine's relationship to dopamine and serotonin, as well as timing berberine and other supplements with workout, food, and sleep for best results. Very, very fact-packed episode. These guys know a lot, and it has inspired me to experiment even more extensively with some of these compounds, which I'll be reporting back in a couple months what my personal results are. But if you want to join us, we're going to dive deep into the science today. I know you will learn a lot. So let's join David and John. David and John, welcome. Thanks for being here. Katie, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. I'm excited to learn from you guys today, especially about something that I've only loosely researched, but experienced the results of, and we're going to get to go deep on that topic in a minute. But before we do, I have notes in my show notes of some pretty fascinating facts about you guys. Um, If I'm reading this right, David, you have swam from Alcatraz and John, you have the fastest lacrosse shot, I believe. So I would love to just hear a little bit of those stories because I'm sure those are not part of your normal scientific background. Yeah. Why don't you go first? Yeah, so um, in high school, before I enjoyed academics, I was uh, more of an on the, in the jock genre and played lacrosse. And uh, during one of the half times at a pen game, they had a uh, fastest shot in Pennsylvania contest. And my teammates uh, suggested I try and go in that and um, won the won the contest. And interestingly, the shot was recorded at 110 miles per hour and was actually unofficially the fastest shot recorded till relatively recently. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and so I grew up swimming, swam in college, and just lo- love swimming. And I got a love for open water swimming. And so my sister-in-law lived in Oakland. And so our family was out there. And I'm like, you know, let's just... I looked online and there was this, uh, this swim and I was like, let's just do it. And, um, you know, they, they kind of take, you're in a boat and you go out that you jump in, you know, near Alcatraz, not right at it because it's, I think it's a, a park. So you, it's not legal to get, go that close, but then you swim in. And so funny story, I was swimming behind this 14 year old, um, who'd done it like 11 times and I'm, and so she's really fast. And so, and they, you kind of basically have to eye the presidio, which is yellow. You're swimming like almost at an angle. You're not swimming towards the, the park. And then you, the current takes you. And so you have to cut to get this really small opening. And this 14 year old didn't cut where I thought we should. And so it ends up, she was right. And so I just caught the lip and was like, had to go full sprint to get into the, this little opening. Um, so I swim against the current, but it was a lot, it was the most fun open water swim I've ever done. So 
I hope to go back with my boys uh, this year or maybe next. I love it. That is no small feat. And I love that it sounds like neither of you trained specifically for those endeavors. They were just things that seemed fun (laughs) because of training you already had. I love that. Yeah. Yes. Well, you guys are also very well accomplished in the research world. And this is what I'm most excited to talk to you about today. Um, Specifically, I know you guys actually have many projects that you've worked on and many supplements, but the one I'm most excited to learn about is berberine, which I'm guessing most people have at least heard of at this point, because I've seen a lot of studies coming out about this and it's being talked about quite a bit. Um, But I think for anybody who isn't maybe familiar with what it is and what it does, maybe start off broad and just kind of give us an overview of what berberine is. Yeah, I mean, I'll dive in and then John has uh, some a different take on it. But so we uh, got into ke- the ketogenic diet uh, with my late wife, Mora's uh, breast cancer. And so basically, you know, keto being, you know, 80% fat, 15% protein, 5% carbs. So basically, if you aim for no carbs, you're getting 5% carbs. And really, you're trying to get keto adaptive. So your mitochondria can use ketones for energy to make ATP as opposed to glucose. And so you feel really good when you're doing it. After she died, I, I, um, you know, largely did, did a ketogenic diet. And at some point, it was about five year, years ago, we heard about berberine and that it was good for blood glucose. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like any hack we can do, cause it's, it's not, I'm not always on the ketogenic diet. And then you cycle on and off and, and any hack to kind of get back on it is I, I thought was amazing. And so we started playing around with it and mainly because of the, the, the benefits in lowering blood glucose. And, um, that's how I, you know, I was introduced to it, but yeah, John, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think some of the best, the best data on berberine is, is that it lowers A1C in some models, you know, reverses insulin resistance. So that's sort of a central feature for me uh, of what berberine is able to do. And the interesting part about it, that is that, you know, A1C is uh, average sugar over a couple of months. So it really takes six weeks or so before you see that change in blood glucose uh, with just plain berberine. Um, I believe it does work in that area. It's, it is, it's helpful, but when you make it bioavailable, it's not bioavailable. It's very, very low, um, like 0.68% bioavailable. So if you get a little bit more in, it actually has a more direct effect on um, blood blood glucose levels. And so we were um, mostly interested in seeing if you could use it as a um, a jump start into ketosis because yeah. we were working with a lot of patients that um, had a tough time getting into ketosis. And so anything that can get you in quicker with less fasting, we thought that would be beneficial, especially for more vulnerable patients that had a harder time getting into ketosis. As you probably know, the age dependence is, is, is really big too because, you know, babies go and get into ketosis in like an hour and yeah, it's graded into, into age. So as you're up in age with the people that we were working with for, for cancer, they sometimes couldn't get into ketosis. So we wanted to drop blood glucose so we could get the butyrate up. And that was basically our first set of data we generated after we figured out how to make it more bioavailable was near instantaneous drop in blood sugar and um, induction in, in butyrate without long, prolonged fasting. Yeah, it's interesting, Katie. A lot of the papers that we, you read or we read, you, they put these molecules like curcumin, like berberine, directly on cells, and and things happen really quickly. And so, a lot of our research, especially while my wife was alive, is you see these really amazing things that impact things like cancer or inflammation. But how how do you know if you take it orally, it actually is doing that same thing? And then, how much do you need to take to make to get that same effect in the paper. And so, you know, that's been a lot of how, you know, we think about things is, is we see a paper that's really amazing, but then how do you make it applicable to us as kind of in in our daily lives? Yeah, I think that's such an important point. Anytime we're talking about the scientific literature is often we see these headlines and buzzwords in the news about the effect that something is having. And I think people often don't realize what's happening in a Petri dish in a lab is not necessarily at all what's going to happen 
in the human body when you have so many other variables introduced. And so I love that you guys are looking at that part of the equation. I also think this is really relevant right now because I've seen so much in the last two years about, as we know, metabolic syndrome being drastically on the rise. There are people talking about kind of the metabolic implications of cancer and a lot of theories about cancer being glucose feeding specifically, or like at least there's implications of glucose with cancer. And so I think this is a really valid and important topic to be talking about right now. And because we're also, we know that excess glucose in the body, from what I understand, also leads to inflammation within the body. But you guys can probably explain what's happening physiologically a little bit better when we have chronically elevated glucose. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say one thing really quickly is that, you know, a lot of us, me included, eat meals late, um, especially if you go out to dinner. And one of the things that happens is when your melatonin kicks in with the evening and nighttime, um, your the ability, it, it arrests your insulin, insulin's ability to metabolize the glucose. So you're having glucose all night. Uh, in your blood. And so one of the great things about ber berberine is that it can really impact that um, if you take a couple, one or two at, at night and they actually get through your gut barrier, it can really cause a dent and a lowering of that blood glucose, which can really change a lot, a lot of different things. And like you're saying with, um, with these inflammation and different um, issues with diseases that are inflammation based. And so I don't know, John, John has the more of the physiological. Yeah, happens. yeah, absolutely. So sometimes it's good to just put a little bit of a framework into, into what we're talking about, just because I think it's, it's not super well understood sort of, you know, what insulin resistance is and, and glucose and glucose storage and things like that. So um, I think a good way to, to remember about this, this, these pathways are that, um, any maneuver that you do that lowers insulin would be life pro prolonging. And that's validated through many um, model organisms and, and experiments, um, even in clinical studies. So the opposite would be is um, if you uh, raise your insulin. So a lot of people don't understand is that insulin is its job is to do two, two different things. Its uh, job is to to hit the receptor on every cell in your body and allow glucose to be taken into the cell so it can, you know, be used in, in energy production. And what's, what's going wrong in uh, type two diabetes is that that insulin receptor is becoming less sensitive to insulin. So you're literally starving your cells and your glucose is going up. And that combination is bad because Excess glucose around is, um, produces what I usually describe as sugar rust. So mm -hmm. um, you get glucose attached to all different kinds of molecules. And um, the accumula that, accumulation of that are, are called uh, advanced glycation end products. And then you can have lipids and proteins um, conjugated that way. So it's similar to reactive oxygen species as well, that they're just doing damage. And so having high circulating blood glucose levels does a lot of bad things. And they're sort of associated with, it's the bad direction of, of all things is um, you rapidly age, you get inflammation and uh, you get inappropriate um, storage of energy too. So that's, that's another one. I'm not sure how far we want to go with this, but you know, um, in type two diabetes, you get your, you, your, your blood sugar is high and your insulin is high and that says store, store your energy. And so you store your energy in your muscles, your liver, mm -hmm. and eventually your, your pancreas. And it's when those organs get filled up with glycogen and then, um, there's no more room to store, to store energy. And then you start storing it as fat. And you, so you get your, uh, fat accumulation in those in those organs, and uh, they start losing function. And so that's why exercise works. It's very simple: is that you you burn up all your glycogen that are in in your muscles, and then you have more room to store store glucose. And so your glucose levels go down, and because your blood glucose levels are down, that's the signal to make less insulin. Also, so that's sort of a 
big picture of, of how insulin works and how sugar, um, excess sugar causes problems. And I think the sleep implication alone is huge because I've had a lot of people on here that talk about the rise in sleep problems, especially in the US. And of course, the reason for that is, of course, very multifaceted, but it's a reason I often recommend and personally try not to eat for at least three or four hours before bed for that reason. So there's not glucose in the body all night. And also the reason I always recommend getting morning sunlight, which we know has an effect on that circadian cycle and resetting the melatonin clock. Um, But it sounds like for many people, especially if there's insulin resistance in this equation, or there's already existing glucose issues, just avoiding food or especially carbs before bed may not solve that problem. So this is kind of like an extra boost to that. I also love that you mentioned exercise because this is one of those areas like quality sleep that I feel like every expert agrees that is very beneficial. And especially when we're talking about the metabolic syndrome and glucose equation, but it seems like this is also a very both and situation that it's probably great to avoid food before bed. It's of course important to exercise. And since we're seeing such a drastic rise in these problems, something like berberine can really help sort of get those things into range. And if they do, is the body able to then maintain normal glucose and insulin regulation more easily once those numbers have started evening out? Yeah, as you as you regain your insulin sensitivity, your insulin levels are able to to drop. And and if someone is interested in trying to improve their health, that would be a great metric to to measure as opposed to the the glucose itself. Um, they kind of follow each other, but you know the better metric is insulin. And um, I think the other half of that equation that it would be probably really good to to talk about is is um, you mentioned mentioned in the morning your your circadian rhythm. So one of the things that happens first thing in the morning is you get a cortisol spike, and cortisol is a glucocorticoid, and that means that it causes a release of sugar. So that's how it wakes you up. So you know don't think of sugar as always being bad. So that that part of the circadian rhythm is 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 a good part of that. But uh, stress, prolonged stress, chronic stress raises your um, your cortisol levels. And basically, that's another big reason for why your blood sugars are high, is you're constantly stimulating the sympathetic part of your ner- nervous system, and you're getting your blood sugars high because you're stressed out, basically. Mm-hmm. So it, it, when you when you talk about the big the, the big effects that help almost everybody, that would be another one that probably I, you, you've talked about is reducing stress. Yeah. And so that that will directly translate to to uh, blood sugars. Yeah. And one thing I've mentioned before when it comes to the stress equation, because probably everybody listening has heard of how stress can have negative effects on the body and it has maybe gotten the recommendation of reduce your stress levels, which is often easier said than done. But I feel like often the stress conversation is focused more on the mental health side. And it seems like there's a very much a cycle here where when our physiological and biological health is not optimal, it actually causes more perception of mental stress and mental stress also then has physiological effects as people have talked about on here before. And so they kind of compound each other, but that also means that you can use that to your advantage when you're working on managing stress. You can use things that are making a biological difference along with stress management techniques to improve that cycle more quickly as well. And I also think of a lot of things you just mentioned lining up with a lot of people now have PCOS. This has been pretty drastically on the rise and insulin resistance is a very common thing in women who have PCOS. Um, So I would guess just anecdotally that someone who has PCOS and is struggling with insulin levels, this might be something they could add to their toolkit to help get those numbers in range, which might then also help their body recover from the other parts of that as well. I'll have to look into that. It it sounds very plausible. Um, I know quite a bit about estrogen and and things like that, Um, but I haven't directly tried to to connect it to berberine. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting, um, you know, in terms of the sleep side and the glucose side. I mean, one of the main um, testimonials we get from uh, berberine is its impact in sleep and people sleep. In fact, in creating some marketing material, I, I fanned out to people who actually use our, our product and was just like, what are you guys noticing? And was thinking, you know, they'll share with me how their blood glucose uh, numbers are dropping, how their ketone numbers are rising. And 75% of the people that came back were like, oh, I sleep great. And I'm like, I didn't, and at that point, I actually didn't know the the connection with sleep outside of, you know, just lowering blood glucose. But yeah, it's, it's, and, you know, when I travel, 
um, which I don't do very often, but occasionally I'll be able to get stuck on a red eye. And so one of the things, you know, combining kind of exercise and what we're talking about is, you know, if, if I, it doesn't have to be just with traveling, if I have a bad night's sleep or, or several in a row, a reset I try to do is really 30 minutes high intensity exercise. And then in the evening, taking the, the our Burberry product as well as our broccoli product to kind of, and that inevitably helps with a reset, get really good night's sleep. Yeah. And it makes sense. I've talked quite a bit on this podcast about how sleep is one of those keys to health. Like I said, that every expert seems to agree on. I've never had a single person in almost 600 episodes come on here and say, sleep is not important. Um, we know we're well aware that sleep is very important. And yet many people still struggle to get not just enough sleep, but quality sleep. Um, and especially there's been a lot of talk about the deep sleep range of sleep and how important that is for body recovery. Uh, and that's definitely what I noticed because I've experimented with the Berber Leap product and I often wear a glucose monitor just because I love the data. I don't have diabetes. I just really enjoy seeing my response to different things. And the two things that stood out to me were an increase in deep sleep because my total sleep is pretty dialed in already and I prioritize sleep, but I saw my deep sleep number increase with use. And then also the my glucose response, I definitely noticed a difference relatively, I think, relatively quickly after taking it. And so I'd love for you guys to delve into that. Um, you mentioned earlier, you know, it's hard to often correlate between what's happening in a lab and what's actually happening in the body. And I know you guys have looked into this with yours specifically. So can you walk us through what sets yours apart? And was I imagining that or was I actually seeing a pretty rapid response to my glucose after taking it? Yeah, I might dive in. And and so with a lot of the studies that you read on the impact of Berberine on blood glucose, it's over weeks, so six to eight weeks. And it's a, so it's, it takes a decent amount of time to see an impact on blood glucose numbers. And again, that's because the typical berberine supplements on the market actually don't pass through your gut barrier at a large amount. They're, like John said earlier, they're like 0.68% bioavailable. So that's, you know, you take a, a gram, you get 6.8 milligrams through. So that's not enough to really impact things. And so one of the neat studies, you know, we did uh, was looking at how quickly does it work? And so when you eat a, a, you know, your dinner and then wake up in the morning, take two of our capsules, uh, what we found in sort of a preclinical study was an 11% drop in blood glucose numbers within three hours. And then what's also neat about that is that we saw an increase from zero ketones to like uh, 0.5 millimole per, per liter. So that's the, the measure. So you actually are in sort of a light ketosis. Yeah, it's interesting um, going back to, to sort of the analogy we we're talking about. So what happens at, at nighttime is your little mini hibernation when mm -hmm. you're sleeping. And so um, there are a lot of things that happen during that time, but, but the melatonin blocking insulin function is basically inside that cell, it's experiencing low glucose. So if you're, if you're lower your glucose in your, in your whole body, uh, say you say you take a berberine before right before bed, um, your blood glucose will lower, and then um, you'll get an even bigger dip in the uh, the drop in functional glucose going inside the cell. Probably important to to introduce a a, a new concept here um, in order to talk about sleep a little bit better is um, one of the differentiators between berberine and some of the other things that lower blood glucose is that um, it's a direct binder of a gene, a very well-studied gene called CMYC, C-MYC. And um, MYC is a, a component of the cell that has a long history, but it's, it's called a carbohydrate binding uh, transcription factor. So it binds to things that are involved in upregulating glucose utilization. And so because a C, um, berberine binds CMYC and inhibits its activity, it is functionally lowering how your cell um, feels glucose. And, and so it's, it's reducing that. So it's, it would work together with um, melatonin and other things that would, would drive your circadian rhythms such that your, your heart rate um, reduction during the night will be better. 
which is kind of a classic hibernation phenomenon. You're really slowing down your your um, metabolism. And then you're also lowering your blood pressure. And um, when you lower your, your blood pressure, um, you repair capillaries um, everywhere in your body and kind of in your head is a is a very vulnerable capillary bed. And so you're able to repair capillaries throughout your body. So that's part of the part of the uh, connection to to um, nighttime dipping in pressure and heart rate, turning off your sympathetic nervous system um, is is through this MIC, CMIC mechanism. And so when you turn off that that system, your your brain's response to that is to lower the electrical activity down into the delta wave frequency. And during that delta wave frequency is what deep sleep basically is. You get rhythmic um, synchronization of your brain wave activity. And that's the only time that your brain is able to move the glymphatic system. So the lymph in your brain. And that's the only time you can um, detox your brain, brain, basically, you can move toxins uh, around to get rid of them. So there, there's kind of more avenues we could talk about in that area. But there's a very clear connection to to deep sleep and brain detox. Which I feel like that's an increasingly important conversation as well, that flushing of that cerebral spinal fluid, which that, at least what I've seen is helping break down those amyloid plaques that can build up in the brain. And of course, that could be a connection to a lot of these uh, mental or like Alzheimer's and deteriorating brain conditions. Um, so I think I expect to see a lot more research on that as well. I'm curious. I mean, that's a pretty substantial ability to affect glucose. Like you guys just mentioned in that study, do you see this separate of even dietary changes? Like I would guess the best answer is a both and when it comes to dietary changes or berberine. Um, but I know the last stat I saw was that most Americans are consuming 16 to 20 teaspoons of added sugar per day. So it, on average, Americans are not doing great with this. But I'm curious if it still has a benefit, even if people aren't necessarily changing their diet. I would, I would still, I think it still would reduce it. Um, so it would be, it would lessen that hammer of, of having a giant spike in glucose. Um, obviously it would work better if you didn't eat the sugar in the first place. That's I mean, what I think. Yeah. And there are, I guess we can just be straightforward. There's, there are a number of folks who uh, have gotten back to us who take our product specifically so they can cheat. You know, they're on the diet and they're like, oh, I want to go eat some pizza. And then they're like, this is great. And so... Um, I mean, one of the things it does, though, is it does, there's sort of a satiation caused from an increase in your butyrate levels. We were just talking about this because I'm like, it seems like people are, are sharing in testimonials that they want to eat less. What's up that? And John's like, it's butyrate. And then I think the other thing we haven't talked about, which is important is, and it's related, is how berberine blocks what's called uh, gluconeogenesis. And so uh, that's where your body when you are have a low blood glucose your body your liver wants to tra transform things like lipids or proteins into glucose and that if, if your body's it doing you know is turned if gluconeogenesis is turned on then you really have a difficulty in having a low blood glucose and so that it's kind of uh, and that, that can be seen with cancer patients um i know that was one thing we we saw because cancer, your cat, your a tumor can do that as well. So, which is awful. Yeah, and the liver effects you guys mentioned. I know I've seen papers about also the pretty drastic rise in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the U.S. Even among children now, which is a pretty concerning statistic because we typically didn't see that until people were older, and now we're seeing it at younger and younger ages. And so, I feel like any tools that can help with that is also going to have a whole body beneficial effect. And you've mentioned butyrate a couple of times. For anyone who's not maybe as familiar with that, can you explain why that is beneficial and why we would want to, to encourage that? Why don't you dive in and I call Yes, yeah, so butyrate um, is basically, I understand it as a, as a protective mechanism for when you're not able to eat frequently. It's an alternative energy source, and so it's it's insulin independent. It doesn't need insulin to um, bring glucose into the cell, so it basically bypasses that whole system. And it also um, is able to fuel your your cell's energy metabolism with less inflammation. So if you run off glucose versus if you run off of butyrate, butyrate is actually more efficient 
um, at converting oxygen into ATP and uh, producing less of the uh, damaging um, effects of, of uh, when you run off of glucose. So it decreases inflammation. And, and usually anybody who has done a prolonged fast, it might be the first time they, they'll, they'll actually feel what it feels like to be without inflammation. And I know that was the case for me when the first time I did a prolonged fast, I was like, oh, this is what it feels like without having sort of generalized pain all over the place. Yeah. And I think the other thing that people really feel is when the brain runs off of butyrate, um, it, it feels really good. So um, it's a addictive feeling of the, yeah. uh, when your brain is really running, running well. Absolutely. That was my experience as well. I typically start the year with a, a long seven to 10 day fast, um, which I realized biologically, you could argue that long is not necessarily beneficial, but I do it for the sort of mental, spiritual benefits at that point. But I find myself often getting a lot of writing done because my brain is so clear and I'm so focused with likely the excess butyrate. But the fact that this is able to increase butyrate in the body seems like it would also be very beneficial for athletes who want to be able to rapidly use glycogen and or butyrate, especially if they're doing longer events. Is it? Do you know if it's been studied in athletes at all or if it's beneficial in that way? I know the, 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 the most studies that I know about it is I'm sure I'm butch, butcher his name, but it's, it's um, Navy SEALs that are, that are doing rebreathing. D, yeah. D. Nick Antonio, D. Nick Antonio, um, but very um, prolific researcher on butyrate. So when you have uh, these rebreathers in, in uh, Navy SEALs where they, they can't uh, release the bubbles, um, you can only you, you can only be in that scenario for a short period of time before you induce seizures and a lot of bad effects. And what they found was that if you run, uh, you can take external butyrate or you can go on a ketogenic diet and it prevents the harm that happens from from um, using these rebreathers so that's kind of a good framework to sort of understand how how um, butyrate works and there's a lot of research now on if you just take butyrate you can actually just take beta hydroxy butyrate uh, it's not very tasty but if you just take like 10 grams of it that amount of of uh, of uh, butyrate will help athletic performance. And I always feel like I have to talk about the other half of, of your butyrate being very high is that, is that you tend to spill um, sodium and yeah. um, uh, minerals. So you have to be careful about uh, uh, making sure you eat more salt. Yeah. Do, uh, Dominic D'Agostinio. D'Agostinio. That's right. He's in Florida, I believe. Um, very good. But yeah, and then I just add with butyrate as well. I mean, there is a shift in your bi microbiome. Um, and actually, my son did a science fair project looking at that. And so basically, it shifts from uh, to a much more um, diverse microbiome when, when you have more butyrate in, in your gut. Uh, and so that obviously the microbiome composition, we're still learning quite a bit. But that's the, the, the I mean, that's super important to have it a more diverse. And I'm also curious, it seems like a lot of people have turned to metformin for similar kind of effect in the body. And certainly metformin has been talked about even sort of off-label use for its anti-aging benefits. I've always been pretty cautious and not tried metformin just because of some data I've seen. But I'm curious if you guys could compare and contrast to metformin since a lot of people seem to be experimenting with it for even the anti-aging side, separate of actually needing it for a glucose regulator. At least for me, the, I mean, the pathways are, are pretty clear in that metformin is an AMP kinase activator. So that pathway is a classic fasting pathway. When you fast, you activate AMP kinase. So taking metformin is mimicking is mimicking fasting. And so that relates also to mTOR. And so those are very clear studies in terms of longevity. Yeah. And of course it's a it's a pharmaceutical compound. So and most most pharmaceutical compounds at some point have have you know side effects or accidentally hitting some some other pathways. So in the case of uh, uh, berberine, it's a natural product. It's been around forever. Your body knows how to metabolize it, and um, so also activates AMP kinase. But that combination of of it inhibiting CMYK at the same time is the big differentiator for me. So yeah. um, you're you're both 
um, activating the pathways that that mimic, you know, uh, the metabolic response to fasting, but you're also decreasing the um, functional uh, activity of carbohydrate response elements. So it's like a, it's two different two different pathways, both in glucose regulation. The I think the other thing too, Katie, is you read a lot about, and uh, especially bodybuilders or athletes really hesitant to use metformin because of the the muscle issues you can't uh, bulk up um, your muscle as easily or and so one of the things that is the difference another differentiator is berberine inhibits the enzyme called myostatin that degrades muscle and so there there's not the same issue that with metformin as uh, with berberine that's exciting to know, even on a personal level, I've been consuming more protein than I used to because I'm trying to get a lot stronger right now, but I'm aware of the potential implications with mTOR. And so I've been strategically using short fast and uh, intermittent fasting along with berberine just to kind of make sure everything stays in, in really good ranges while I'm doing that. Um, and you've mentioned taking berberine at night and how that can be valuable for sleep. And we talked about the cortisol spike in the morning being beneficial. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about timing and dosing for people who are wanting to use berberine most strategically. Um, what would that look like in an average day with timing in relation to food and exercise potentially? Are there any tricks to using it the most efficiently? Why don't you dive in and then I'll share my perspective. Yeah. So, um, because it is, is functionally blocking the, the, um, the activity of, of, you know, glucose and things like that. I think the uh, first thing in the morning, depending if you're, if you're diabetic or not and, and what you're trying to accomplish, whether you would want to take it uh, first thing in the morning. But I think for sure I would I'd take it a little bit later if I were trying to do yeah. any kind of bodybuilding, things like that. So uh, people may not know about myostatin, but it has kind of been a holy grail for a lot of um, pharmaceutical um, searches. Most people know about it in that um, uh, myostatin inhibits muscle growth. And so when it's mutated, uh, I'm not sure if you've ever seen those either dogs or cows that look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's what it is. It's actually a myostatin um, knockout animal and so they become super muscular and so when you take um uh, both sulforaphane and berberine are capable of inhibiting myostatin you're able to to add add muscle um more easily so for for most people that that's a that's a big one you know one of my favorite papers on berberine and this happened like i said when i, I after i gathered these testimonials from our Ber berbelite customers and saw that sleep was sort of the main reason people were taking it. I'm like, well, what's going on here? And so there, there's a paper uh, that basically compares berberine with uh, Valium as a sleep aid and how berberine was superior to Valium uh, as a sleep aid. And this is just even the berberine that doesn't get through superior, uh, which was really interesting. It was over a longer period of time than how our, ours would work, but it showed a, a 25% increase in dopamine, which is really huge. And then a 30% increase in serotonin levels, uh, just from the use of the, the, ber the berberine. So I think from a sleep standpoint, both of those, you know, are, are important. Okay. So afternoon and evening, probably for timing on this for the most part. Yeah. So, I mean, what I say, if he, uh, and it's on the label, if people, um, everybody's on a budget, my, thought as far as biggest bang for the buck would be take both capsules. If it's two capsules a day, take both in the evening. And like John was wisely said, it really depends on what you're after. If you're after sleep, two in the evening. If you're doing other things, maybe not. But yeah, if it's if it's sleep, then two before bed. Yeah, say, say for instance, you were, you're trying to drain your, your, your liver of um, fat, you know, fatty liver. Um, getting your blood glucose levels low and keeping it low uh, and, and basically running your metabolism um, off of that fat all day long will, will, will drain it more quickly. So say, say for a person who's fighting insulin resistance, getting to that drained fatty um, liver or the same thing happens with muscles is fatty muscle will get used up. And that's why exercise along with, you know, some of these things that lower 
lower your uh, blood glucose levels are, are going to work together to, to meet that goal. But like in, in your case where you're trying to put a little bit more muscle on, um, I would do it outside of that cortisol window. Awesome. I'm excited to experiment more with that. This episode is brought to you by Extrema Pure Ceramic Cookware, which is the original non-toxic cookware on the market. It's a lifestyle investment for your kitchen, for your body, and for the earth because people have been cooking with clay pots for over 10,000 years. Extrema spent years perfecting the proprietary clay blend that balances the beauty of pottery, the durability of porcelain, and the temperature benefits of stoneware. Because healthy meals don't just start with fresh, nutrient-dense produce, though that's important too. They also require safe pots, pans, skillets, and baking sheets that aren't leaching things into our food. I have many of their cookware pieces in my kitchen for this reason. All of their cookware is pure ceramic and handcrafted by this family-run company. I love that they are durable and can go from stove to oven to dishwasher, and I can even use tough cleaners and scrubbers to clean them. They have a new signature skillet line that has shallow side walls and a smooth 100% pure ceramic cooking surface for ultimate strength and durability. They let you sear, saute, fry, and sizzle from your stovetop or even your barbecue grill. And these timeless additions to your kitchen will become your go-to for everyday cooking. There's no toxins, no metals, no maintenance, and worry-free cooking every day. Use the code wellness to save 15% off your entire purchase by going to extrema.com. That's X-T-E-R-E-M-A.com and make sure to use the code wellness to save 15%. This episode is sponsored by Just Thrive Health. Thanks to our modern world, it's impossible to cut out all stress. If you ever feel that tightness in your tummy when you're sitting in rush hour traffic or you can't sleep because of your never ending to-do list, these things are just part of the modern day stress we encounter. And that's because it's your gut and not your brain that is responsible for your stress response. And the solution then isn't just to stop or avoid stress, though that can certainly be helpful when it's possible, but instead to find effective ways to manage it. Just Calm is the brand new product from Just Thrive Health, and it represents a revolutionary new approach to uplifting your body, your mind, and your soul naturally. Just Calm has been clinically proven in multiple studies to help reduce our perceived stress, balance cortisol levels, which is really, really important for many things, improve our sleep quality, and even encourage focus and flow. And for really unbeatable stress management, I have personally been pairing Just Calm with Just Thrive Spore-Based Probiotic as well. And here's why. We all have heard of the term gut instinct or gut brain connection, but that connection is more powerful than you think. Your gut and brain talk to each other, sending signals all day long. So a healthy gut isn't just crucial for immune and digestive health, though it is for those as well. It's also one of the best ways to beat stress in the long term. By giving your gut the beneficial bacteria it needs to thrive, Just Thrive Probiotic not only supports your best gut health, but it creates the perfect foundation for Just Calm to perform at maximum strength as well. And when your gut is happy and your stress is under control, you'll be able to keep calm and win the day every day. Don't miss episode 539 to learn more about this groundbreaking company. But right now, you can save 15% off this dynamic duo when you go to Just thrivehealth.com slash wellnessmama and use the code wellnessmama, all one word, at checkout. So that's J-U-S-T-T-H-R-I-V-E-H-E-A-L-T-H.com slash wellnessmama and the code wellnessmama. Also, for just clarity, I think, can you explain the difference between berberine and curcumin? I know you also have a curcumin product. So what? Are, how are those used differently? Can they be used together or just kind of walk us through similarities and differences? Yeah, so I, I started playing around with all the favorite molecules that I, I used to show from um, screens that I did. We were trying to start a company for do, doing personalized medicine, and we were trying to figure out combinations um, that would really help people that had advanced cancers. And so what jumped out of that very early on was sulforaphane and curcumin and berberine and, and a few other ones that um, we might introduce uh, in, in the coming uh, months and years is that those first three, actually four, kerstin also, they're synergistic. And so a lot of people talk about things being synergistic, but um, we used what was considered the 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 most strict test of synergy is where you 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 take the compound and you dilute it um, until you can't see an effect. If you're looking at say a kinase or an F, NRF2 activation, any of these things that are known targets of sulforaphane berberine, 
You dilute it until you don't see anything. And then you dilute, say, sulforaphane until you don't see anything. And then when you add those two together, nothing but plus nothing, and you see a, an effect. And so for all our first four products, we know that there's, they, they pass that test for synergy. And so sulforaphane, uh, an additional ingredient in our broccoli, um, curcumin and berberine, and then also quercetin, they, they fulfill that very strict criteria for, for synergy. And so when you just take, say, one supplement by itself, the, the concentration that ends up being in blood or being in contact with your cells may not reach the, the, the level that they see in a cell culture. Um, for instance, curcumin often in cell culture to see inhibition of its primary target is NF kappa B. So inflammation is in the range of 20 to 30 micromole, but you can see an effect in the, the low micromole levels if you combine two of those together. So what I usually say about curcumin is curcumin, its main target is inflammation. So it's, it's best at activate, at inhibiting NF kappa B. And then berberine would be its primary target would be amp kinase and CMYK. So they're covering that territory. And if you start looking at a bunch of those papers, you realize that the the same molecules are in, in, involved in the same targets. And so when you work towards a pathway in two different signaling pathways um, is, is the most likely avenue for synergy. So um, sulforaphane, berberine, curcumin um, are, are in those categories. Sulforaphane is NRF2, berberine, amp kinase, um, curcumin is NF kappa B. Yeah, and I'd say also, Katie, um, the our cur curcumin formula we actually bind to a protein, and actually, so that's form it's formulated slightly differently. We actually want to bind the berberine to a protein as well and uh, increase its bioavailability even more. Um, but from we're we are a very small mom kind of mom and pop kind of a company, and so you can think of us as sort of a micro brewery that makes supplements. We do everything here. Um, so we're making the powders we put into the capsules. So right now we we determine that if we do a combo with berberine and sulforaphane, it, it actually makes it pretty bioavailable. It's about, uh, but it's about half bioavailability as if we'd bound it to the protein. And how that compares to regular on the market is it's really you, you don't see it above background. Um, if you take a berberine product, you really don't see anything. And so we're with our Burbilly product currently, you actually see it moves the needle both. And you see it too in like you you experienced with your glucose monitor, like we experienced in our clinical trial, it actually moves the needle with blood glucose and ketones quickly within hours versus weeks. So... Yeah, I was extremely excited when I first found your sulforaphane product because I knew previous to that, my thought understanding was that it had not been yet put into a capsule in an effective way. And so there were a lot of years of growing broccoli sprouts in my kitchen and doing the whole thing with temperature and mustard seed and trying to make sure I was preserving everything in them. And, you know, broccoli sprout smoothies on their own don't taste super great. So I'm extremely glad to have capsules now. So I guess you guys have given so much great information and I'm for my own personal use trying to integrate in an optimal scenario, what would be like my dosing on a lot of these different things in a given day and timing, because I'm excited to actually experiment with these over the next few months while I'm in this muscle building phase and wanting to keep an eye on my glucose and just see how it affects me. I mean, if you were um, designing a strategy for your, for your goals, um, I would probably tell you um, that uh, one of the things that's pretty well known is if, if you are fasting, your, your growth hormone levels increase. So that's very important. But what a lot of people miss out there is, um, in order, in order to get anabolism, the, you know, the muscle building, you have to, you have to in, increase your TGF alpha. So uh, the, uh, or IGF, sorry, IGF one in order to create that. So fast before, before your, before your workout within 20 minutes of the end of your workout, eat no, no sugar, but take branch chain amino acids. And so in, in that case, you will get your IGF-1 induction and your growth hormone induction 
increased and it sustains until you eat your next meal. And so if you eat any sugar um, in between there, it turns that system off. And so try to extend that out to your to your next meal. And then you'll have growth hormone and IGF-1 high for um, the, those few hours afterwards to maximally induce um, um, myogenesis. So like your, if you have a whey protein, that would be an ideal branch chain amino acid source. Okay. Got it. I'm excited to experiment with that. And I think another relevant topic that I know could be an entire episode all on its own, but I want to at least touch on, I think when asked, John, what your TED Talk would be in a week, if you were to give one, you said why most people need much more salt in their diets, not less. And I think this is another really relevant conversation. I've actually seen a lot of data about sodium consumption in nursing moms, for instance, and how it affects milk supply. But I think for a lot of years, we've gotten the message that salt is bad and a lot of people are afraid of sodium. And you mentioned the keto diet, which I know changed is your relationship with minerals and electrolytes. But can you just kind of briefly give us an overview on what could be, I'm sure, at least <laughs> one if not many episodes of why we maybe don't need to fear sodium and why we perhaps need more of it? This is that um, it's another hat that I wear. Is I, I run an analytical lab that, that does uh, testing for salt sensitivity. And so uh, the, the big broad picture there is that uh, only... Around 20% of the population uh, is actually salt sensitive. So that means that if you eat um, excess salt, your blood pressure will go up. And so the whole rest of the, the population can eat, can eat salt without, without harm. Um, and so th that's sort of the background for it. And then in, in your area of, of uh, interest right now is your ability to um, work out. So if you take extra salt before your meal, um, what has been shown to happen is that you're able to maintain cooling during your exercise uh, much better. And so you can sustain um, vigorous exercise for a longer period of time. If you're, if you're low in salt, then you'll overheat. And so that's kind of a symptom of of if if that's the reason you stop is because you're overheating, it may be that you're you're low low in salt. So so that whole that whole area I think is a is an area that's very you know very much in the, the medical world, and you know we're doing the doing the studies to prove it right now. We have all the uh, a lot of the pathways um, figured out there, but um, one probably to talk about here that um, just to to. Um, peak interest is that we discovered that about 15% of the population, if you um, go in a low, low salt and a, or a high salt diet, the blood pressure goes up on the low salt arm of the diet. So actually going in a low salt diet is is harmful for for 15% of the population. And uh, so uh, the probably the only other connection to, to what we've been talking about so far is that a lot of people don't know that um, insulin resistance is very closely related to salt sensitivity. So if you are insulin resistant, um, there's a much higher chance of you being sensitive to excess salt. So even in the people that who should reduce their salt or salt sensitives, those people can actually reverse that effect if you take care of your, your insulin problems. So we always talk about the, you know what is the what is the bad white crystal and what's the um, the good one and so it, it's certainly a mixed bag and depends on you know your personal status but even in in the in the few people that you know twenty percent of the population that should curtail excess salt if they were able to get their insulin resistance under control they would most likely be um, less salt sensitive so. And then in the other arm, you should eat excess salt. So that's, um, I found out that from my own study because I'm what's called inverse salt sensitive. So I have the reverse um, paradoxical increase in blood pressure on low salt. That's fascinating. I'm an inverse modulator on a lot of the GABA pathways. And so I have to be careful of not taking that at night or I'm up all night, which is the opposite of most people. 
but that's fascinating. I did not know that about the temperature side. I had Dr. Craig Heller on here to talk about the glabrous regions of skin and the cool hand study and how temperature regulation seems to really make a difference in both your intensity and your duration of exercise. So I've been experimenting with my kids who are athletes in cooling hands between pole vault jumps, for instance. But that's really fascinating to know about that side of the equation as well, which will further encouragement to encourage them on their mineral consumption and salt consumption. Um, are there any cautions to be aware of for people with taking berberine to be aware of any times it should or should not be taken and or contraindications for taking it? I'm not sure. I think, um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let David talk about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so it does lower your blood glucose. And so you need to be careful. So you don't want to take, uh, of all our supplements of all, uh, the ber berberine, um, especially our forum uh, does can move your blood glucose numbers, um, and so you just want to not take too much. Uh, I'd say that that's important. On a side note, too, I, I know you're friends with Rob, Rob Wolf, who's a dust salt. Um, it'd be great to get he and uh, John together to have a chat. Uh, I, I listened to him on your podcast. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they would like be they would be best buds. So. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we can do a follow-up round too after I do a couple months of experimentation with this and have glucose results to share. And I would love to get Rob on. He's always such a fun conversation and knows so much. That would be exciting. And then I'd say also, if you're doing keto and you're using ber berberine, I mean, and John alluded to this, but like, uh, I remember I was doing like a really strict keto, um, kind of militant keto and wasn't aware of the salt implications and like i had like tachycardia and arrhythmia one night and i text john i'm like could this be the keto and he's like yes and so thankfully we i had some potassium citrate magnesium citrate um and sodium chloride just you know in the house and so i just mixed together a little mixture of these salts and chugged it and like within 30 minutes everything was fine but it totally like you can you can really mess yourself up if uh, because you're dropping so much salt on a ketogenic if you're in strict keto. And I learned uh, I, I learned a new pathway for me that I was not aware of is is if you're if you're pretty consistently being um, uh, low low sugar consumption and you are walking around with a glycogen lowered liver and, and muscles if you uh, suddenly go out to dinner and have a very sugary meal, you actually use uh, potassium in order to st store uh, glycogen. And so you can become like, you can become potassium deficient and have heart palpitations from that. So it's another salt related issue that uh, people can be aware of. You know, if you are consistently um, ketogenic or um, eating low, low sugar and you've drained your, your, your glycogen levels um, obviously drained your fat levels in your liver and muscles, and then your also glycogen um, lowered. Uh, you, you have to be careful about that binge eating uh, more so than most people because it can really make you feel pretty pretty rotten. Good to know. I've taken so many notes, and I'm excited to keep experimenting with berberine and track my results. I'm such a data nerd, so I have spreadsheets that I put all these things into, and I'm excited to play with it. A couple of last quick questions before we wrap up, since our time has flown by. The first being, if there are books or a number of books for either of you that have had a profound impact on your life, and if so, what they are and why. Me go first. Yeah, so my, my favorite book was uh, by Weston Price, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And so I always like going back and reading very old books that had it right. And um, I think that's the, the most amazing version of that that I've ever seen, where they haven't changed their stance on the consumption of any of the, uh, the, the sort of foods that were really vilified throughout the years and sort of a, a, almost 90 years uh, before its time predicted many of the nutrition um, uh, research that's pretty solid right now where they, you know, they said very early on that, you know, these large number of native societies that ate a certain way produced healthy people without dental cavities. And then it turns out that he discovered uh, what they called at the time was price factor, but later on was discovered to be vitamin K2 the necessity of high fat soluble vitamins um, in the proper ratios 
the wrong vilification of uh, saturated fats and on and on and on and on. So they, they literally were 80 years, 80 to 90 years ahead of their time. And so uh, that book was very eye-opening to me.